name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So our Christmas tree is not doing well. It um, has about 12 more hours it has to make it, and then I think that we can uh, put it out with the Christmas boxes when they're empty. Uh, we got a enormous tree. It's not really shaped so much like a tree as much as a lollipop, but uh, uh, as we got it into the house, all of a sudden, uh, all the needles were falling off. And actually, every time you open the door, it's kind of a relaxing sound of needles falling <laughs> through all the branches. Uh, at first, we thought we were going to have to get a megaphone to tell what we had gotten to the people on the other side of the tree, and now we'll be able to see right through it. Uh, but as the tree loses its needles, it looks more and more like an enormous version of another famous tree. You know which Christmas special I'm probably referring to, Charlie Brown Christmas. Now, do you remember that story? Do you remember the, the gist of the Charlie Brown Christmas? Uh, Charlie Brown is just not feeling in the spirit this Christmas. Linus chides him for not being in the spirit, but Lucy has a pretty good suggestion. She said it might be helpful if you directed the neighborhood nativity play. She then expresses her own Christmas frustrations that all she ever gets is toys when what she really wants is real estate. Then as he wanders back, he comes across Sally, who's making her copious wish list for Santa, finally suggesting that she'd really just be satisfied with plenty of 10s and 20s. And at rehearsal, Charlie Brown is discouraged as the nativity is being modernized with dance routines, new snappier music, and even new characters, a Christmas queen. Charlie Brown then notices that there's no ornamentation, there's very few decorations, or even a Christmas tree. And he thought maybe that would add some spirit to the play, to his life. And so he goes with Linus and Lucy to go get a tree. And immediately he connects with this small, spindly little tree that looks a lot like he probably feels in general and maybe even about himself. Linus and Lucy discourage him from picking this particular tree that's all of about three and a half feet tall and has more brown than green. But he's confident that once decorated, this tree will be perfect. Maybe if he can redeem and fill this tree with Christmas splendor and beauty, he can fill that emptiness that he's feeling. I do realize that I may be over-dramatizing or psychoanalyzing a Christmas cartoon, but please indulge me. And when he takes the tree back to the set and he decorates it, he's laughed at and criticized unmercilessly. As it feels like Christmas, where that Christmas joy he so much wants to experience is slipping away. And he yells out in frustration, does anyone know what Christmas is really about? We all know what happens next. Linus says, I know. And he walks center stage with his blankie in tow. And he begins to read from that second chapter of Luke that we just heard. And upon hearing that story, that glimpse of heaven dipping down, of God born in the messiness of a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes, with barn animals watching attentively, and exuberant shepherds charging in. The peanut gang's hearts soften a bit, and they begin to fill with that seemingly elusive Christmas spirit. Then they begin to offer Charlie and his tree some encouragement. They start to take decorations from Snoopy's over-decorated doghouse, and pretty soon the tree that mirrored Charlie Brown's doldrums, but also his hope, his hope for something with the power to transform his Christmas, now stands taller and fuller, reflecting that Christmas joy he's been seeking. Then they all break into hark the herald angels sing, as the snow begins to fall, and we know that in some small way, on that stage, heaven has opened in that moment. 
Sometimes as we try to get ourselves into the spirit of the season, we struggle. We struggle with what isn't light and joy in the world some 2,000 years later. We lose sight of what happened in that first Christmas. God came and dwelt among us. It wasn't regal in the conventional sense. It wasn't perfect, but it was good. And it was full of resounding joy. And that infant child did not fix everything, but none of the broken is ever apart from God ever again. Now, 1968, 51 years ago, was one of the hardest years in modern history, especially in this country. Thousands had died amidst the deadliest year of the Vietnam War. And the war had divided our nation, and it wasn't the only thing dividing our nation. In April of that year, Martin Luther King had been assassinated. In June, Robert Kennedy had been shot and killed. Our country, our world seemed broken. Now, it's worth noting at this moment that the very first Christmas took place not only in a stable far from home, but while a nation still felt the scars of their past defeats of exile. As the religious leadership was splintered, a fighting against one another. And Luke reminds us with the decree from Emperor Augustus that they were heavily under Rome's thumb. So back to 1968. As the year was coming to an end and people decorated their trees and went about their Christmas preparation, three American astronauts were preparing for the first manned orbit of the moon. And on Christmas Eve, after they rounded the moon and faced the earth from behind the moon, the views of the earth were stunning. Images never seen. That Christmas Eve, an unprecedented number tuned into the broadcast from outer space. Astronaut William Anders began, For all the people on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message we would like to send you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, and he saw that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Jim Lovell picks up. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And then Frank Borman picks up. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Foreman then added, and from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night. Good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. In those words and images, it was as if God was looking down to earth from heaven, assuring humanity. He's got the whole world in his hands. Don't worry. He's got the whole world in his hands. It was a heaven meets earth moment that people desperately needed. But Christmas, Christmas, Christmas isn't just our assurance that God has the whole world in his hands, that we are not forgotten, that God is still at the helm. It's that God was willing to put himself into our hands. 
to enter fully into our lives. Those moments, like on that stage, as Linus reminded his friends what Christmas was all about. Those moments from an aircraft thousands of miles away. And like hopefully a moment that maybe came and went this Christmas Eve, where we feel at least a flitter of heaven sweeping down. We're reminded that heaven and earth have met. They've met in that Christ child. Those are not fleeting moments of reality. Those are fleeting glimpses of a reality that has existed ever since that moment. That God came down. Those moments aren't fleeting. They're glimpses into our ultimate reality, our ultimate truth. That God is indeed with us. Emmanuel has come. Amen.